was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory And the king of love had given up his life and the darkest day in history There on There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse is blood atoned
thank you, Father. Oh, God, we thank you. Oh, Lord, we worship you. Whole church, take this this morning, despite what we're going through.
Welcome to CLC's online service. I'm Roxana, and these are this week's announcements. Are you a good listener and communicator? Are you willing and available to pray for those in need? Are you wanting to find ways to continue to serve and give back? We're looking for volunteers to join our new telecare ministry team. We'll set you up with a list of CLC members to contact on a regular basis so that we can continue to stay socially connected. It's as easy as a quick phone call to check in and show we care through prayer and support. If you're interested, please email life at Christian Life Center to let us know that you'd like to help. Our virtual life groups are starting this week. We'll be able to watch the video series together and then be able to discuss in small groups from the comfort of your own home, social distancing, of course. Sundays, starting today at 6 p.m., we have Luke the Eyewitness series with Dave McCarthy. Tomorrow and on Mondays at 7 p.m., we have the Book of Philippians with Keith Preston. And Tuesdays at 6.30, we have The Struggle is Real with Pastor Andrew. And finally, Tuesdays during the evenings at 8 p.m., we have Identity and Sexuality with Pastor Sam. Text the word Life Groups to 905-686-1411 to sign up or check our Instagram page for all the Zoom links. Our annual business meeting, originally scheduled for today, has been postponed but please head to our website, www.christianlifecenter.ca to view our 2019 annual business report to prepare for our upcoming meeting. We don't know when it is yet, but we'll let you know the date once we figure things out. Our intern Shay's time at CLC has sadly come to an end, and we'd like to honor and encourage her with a love offering. Please prayerfully consider financially investing and blessing her by clearly indicating in the appropriate space provided that your donation this week is a love offering for intern or intern or Shea Smith Brown, whatever it takes to help us know where to designate your funds appropriately. There are four ways for you to send your love offering for Shea or to give your regular tithes and offerings. By texting the word GIVE to 905-686-1411 by visiting our website, www.christianlifecenter.ca, under Donate, by sending an mon- email money transfer to life at christianlifecenter.ca, or by mailing in a check to 1030 Ravenscroft Road, Ajax, Ontario, L1T4R9. We thank you for your support, your generosity, and your faithfulness in this way. Please remember that the CLC office is now closed to the public until further notice. This includes all programming and rentals until further notice, with the exception of our Helping Hands Food Bank on the third Saturday of every month. If you need to reach any of the CLC staff, please send an email to life at christianlifecenter.ca or any of our CLC email email addresses and we'll try and get back to you as quickly as possible. We thank you for your continued patience, understanding, and flexibility during these challenging circumstances. We'll be sure to keep everyone posted as new information becomes available. Until we're able to be together again, please stay connected with us through Instagram, through Facebook, our weekly emails, or through our website, and please spread the word to those who may not have access to these things. We miss you, CLC fam. I'm Roxana, and those are this week's announcements. Good morning, CLC Church. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys this morning. Most of you already know who I am, but for those of you who don't, it's Shay speaking. I've been the intern here for the past 12 weeks. Um, This has been one of the most rewarding and fruitful yet stretching seasons of my life. Um, Actually, not so much the stretching part because Bible college was just one big stretch, but um, I really feel like this has been a season of restoration for me where God has been restoring my hope um, for the future. He's placed lifelong relationships in my path. And also he's just engraved his faithfulness um, into my heart. Um, 
yeah, so I can definitely see the promised land, but more than anything, CLC has made me aware of the promised presence of God that is with me as I go. Now, before I get into my message, I'd like to start off by uh, saying some personal thank yous to the staff here. Um, I'd like to start off with Pastor Sam. Pastor Sam, thank you so much um, for your willingness to pour into me, not only as a mentor and a leader, but also as a father figure. This actually means a lot to me. I also honor you and your integrity to the Word of God, both on and off the stage. Pastor Andrew, thank you so much for exemplifying um, someone who fears the Lord, but also enjoys having a good laugh. You're absolutely hilarious, and I honor you. Thank you for your heart of worship. Pastor Kareem, thank you so much for um, just breaking me out of the, the box of what ministry has to be and, and challenging me to take a step further, to use my gifts and abilities to glorify um God and Roxy thank you so much for just holding it down you are the glue to this um, dynamic here and I, I honor you and your heart um, towards God to Connie and Angelo I'd like to thank you guys personally for your hospitality thank you for opening up your home to me um, you guys have been so loving and kind I will always hold a place for you guys in my heart um, and, and I just pray a, a special blessing over your marriage and to you guys here at CLC I, I thank you so much for making this experience a lot less intimidating and and you guys have just really encouraged me and I appreciate it so much so we're gonna get started but first let's pray all right, Father, I thank you so much for who you are. Um, I thank you that you are here in our midst. Um, and so my prayer is simply that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. I pray that this would be more about you and ministering to your people. I pray that you would heal broken perspectives um, and that ultimately you would just have your way, God. In Jesus' name, amen. See, for the longest time, I actually hid myself from God, even as a Christian. I've discovered that it's really easy to be labeled a Christian, um, but fail to walk in intimacy with the Lord. Failing to respond to him as he calls us to draw close by name. I hid myself from God for many reasons, actually. One of the main being that I failed to understand that by nature he was a perfect he is a perfect and loving father. My lens through which I saw God was actually not only flawed, but broken. I saw him through the lens of my earthly father who actually abandoned me at a young age um, and broke many promises. So the idea of God being a father prior to giving my life to him was not appealing to me. I also hid from God because I constantly felt, felt condemned by him. I saw him more as a judge and I was aware that I never really did what I knew I ought to do. And so I had a guilty conscience. So when God first called to me um, to come close to him, I actually hid from him in guilt and shame because I could not believe that someone like God could love someone like me. I felt as though I couldn't face him. See, how many of us today fall into the same pattern of thinking and might even be hiding from God as we speak, whether it's by choosing not to walk with God on the daily basis, um, whether that's through prayer, reading our word, and just staying in constant communication with him, or it's hiding certain parts of us from him like our emotions, our struggles, brokenness, unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, and the list goes on. See, I would reckon that to be hidden from God is to be cut off from peace that passes our understanding, or life in abundance, joy and love in its fullest. But what would happen if we actually decided to respond to the beckoning call of God instead of always hiding from him in guilt and shame? What happens if we willingly come before him naked um, with all the baggage that we're carrying? And how can we do this knowing that he is a perfect and holy God? See, in my opinion, one of the most devastating things that can possibly happen 
is having someone you love deeply hide away from you in shame and guilt because they've done something that you don't necessarily agree with and they fail to understand that despite that, you still love them. For example, children. See, I'm no parent, but I happen to be the oldest of four kids, ranging between the ages of four to 24. This gives off the impression that I'm like a second mother figure in the household, um, which I don't exactly um, mind because I get to tell them what to do, my siblings what to do, as opposed to having them to tell me what to do. I know this is a pride thing. Uh, God, God is still working on me though. See, but I love my, my siblings dearly. And I try to live in a way that they would be confident in my love for them, that, that when I correct them, it's done more so to propel them in the right direction as opposed to punishing them or condemning them. And so my youngest brother, Kajai, will often get himself in trouble. He's four years old. And when trying to correct him, um, it'll pan out something like this. Kajai, uh, come here, please. Kajai is actually hiding um, as I call him. Kajai, could you come here, please? Where are you? Still no answer. Kajai, uh, what are you doing? Can you come here, please? And finally, when he decides to come, he'll usually respond along the lines of, I thought you were mad at me, so I didn't want to come. See, how often do we do the same thing with God? How often do we hide from him in general when he calls us or tugs on our hearts to come close? How often do we run from God? This leads me to the focal point of this message that I'm going to share with you guys titled, Where Are You? Let's open our Bibles to Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10, and take a closer look at what was taking place when Adam hid from God. Let's read. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now, many of us have actually heard this story. We have Adam and Eve who lived in perfect harmony with the Lord, perfect communion in the Garden of Eden until they chose to eat the forbidden fruit. After eating the forbidden fruit, they were made aware of their nakedness. They were aware of the fact that they were disobedient and that God said that the day they ate the forbidden fruit, they would surely die. So now fast forward, we have the Lord who constantly walked with Adam and Eve, approaching them for his daily visit in the cool of the day. And he calls to them, Adam, where are you? Instead of Adam and Eve coming to meet with the Lord like they usually did, they hid from him. Instead of me running to God in the last season of my, in my life, I hid from him in guilt and shame because my perspective of him was skewed. I didn't see him as a loving father. I saw him as a condemning judge. Instead of Kajai coming to me, running to me when I called his name, he actually hid from me in guilt and shame. He couldn't understand that I loved him despite his mistakes. See, sometimes instead of us running to Jesus, when we fall short, we'll actually hide from him in guilt and shame. This suggests to me that when we fail to see God and his intentions through the pure lens of who he is, it can hinder our desire to draw close to him. Or the idea of loving forbidden fruit, loving our sin, can cause a barrier between us and God because he is perfect, because he is holy. And so my first attempt is to help us understand the character of God in that he is a loving father, a creator who knows what's best for us, which leads to my first point that he is a personal God. God is a personal God. 
See, the book of Genesis not only tells us about the origins of the universe, our world, plants, animals, and human beings, but it also tells of the beginning of God's relationship with man. In Genesis, we see a story unraveling of a compassionate and tender hearted creator who goes above and beyond to not only provide for his creation, but also has a desire to have a relationship with his created beings. God is a personal God. For those who believe in God, there appears to be two categories that they can fall in sometimes. This being deism or theism. Deism is the belief that God is in fact the creator of the universe and does not intervene. Essentially, he created the universe and set it up to function, but stepped away with no desire to have a relationship. Theism, on the other hand, presents the idea that God not only created the universe and everything in it, but also intervenes in the world and sustains a relationship with his creation. As one who has tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord relationally, and has also studied the word of God, I believe the latter to be true, that God actually intervenes with and desires a personal relationship with his creation. And we can actually see this in the chapter just before Adam and Eve hid from God. See, after God created man in his image and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, Genesis 2, 8, 9, Eight to nine says, then the Lord God planted a garden, Eden, in the east, and there he had placed the man he made. Then the Lord God made trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful, that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And from Genesis 2.15 onwards to verses 25, I believe there's so much we can take away about the character of God and how he is a personal God who cares for his creation. Now, I'm not going to read it word for word, but I do have a couple observations. See, in verses 9 to 15, God created a place for man to flourish, enjoy life in abundance, and tend to the Garden of Eden. In verses 16, God provided food for Adam. He told him that he can eat freely from any tree in the garden except the tree the knowledge of good and evil. I believe this showcased the sovereignty of God over man, what set God apart from man in that he gave a command not to eat forbidden fruit. This showcased that God not only provides, but there are things we ought not to touch. It also speaks of our ability to, to listen to God and honor him um, by keeping his commands or to do as we please. See verse 19 to 20, God created a, bum, a bunch of wild animals and birds. Then he gave Adam the opportunity to personally name these animals. See, God trusted man to name his animals. In verses 21 to 25, God acknowledged that it was not good for man to be alone. The animals and the birds were not enough. And so he caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep and created from him a wife with Adam's rib. In which Adam responded, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And the chapter ends with this, Adam, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. I want you guys to really catch that. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. See, from this observation, we can see that God is not only a provider, but one who cares about the well-being of his creation and personally provides and walks with Adam consistently. He went as far to give Adam guidelines as well, what to eat, what not to eat. Even after Adam and Eve fell, after they clothed themselves with the leaves in the garden because they were aware of their nakedness, God actually clothed them with better clothes to cover up their nakedness, even after confronting them 
for their disobedience. See, the heart of God towards man is pure. But he is also a holy and perfect God without sin, not a man that he should lie. And so disobedience resulted in death and put a barrier between man and God. But still, he asked Adam, where are you? This leads to my second point that sin causes a skewed perspective of God that needs to be healed or we will choose to remain disconnected from God. See, how often do we try to cover ourselves up with good works or do things to try and earn God's love when we mess up instead of coming before him just as we are and admitting our faults? I believe to live in such a way is to have a skewed perspective of who God is and that he is a personal God who desires a relationship with us despite our failures. See, when we feel like we need to earn God's love, something is definitely off. In the last season of my life, I actually found myself doing this running away from God the Father because I constantly felt condemned. The second I messed up, I actually felt doomed. And I never wanna, wanted to hear from him because I was terrified of what he might say to me. It got to the point where I actually started to punish myself. Um, there was one night um, I decided I was gonna sleep on the floor to sacrifice the comfort of my bed, because only then would God be pleased with me. See, this is a very twisted mindset. Guilt and shame will cause us to live in such a way. Feeling condemned and failing to understand that there is actually no condemnation for those who are found in Christ, who live not by the, the flesh, but by the spirit. See, moreover, when we feel condemned, it hinders our ability to walk with God in intimacy as a loving father. We end up hiding from him and close certain parts of ourselves off, which leaves room for more sin to take place that actually causes a barrier between ourselves and God. A list of what can run rampant in our life when we choose to do this is just blatant disobedience pride, unconfessed transgressions, demonic influences, refusing to honor God as God, sin, an unforgiving heart, hardened heart, and deep-rooted grudges against one another. See, more in depth, I would suggest that the disconnect that can take place from allowing all of this sin to run rampant in our lives um, can leave room for us to see God through the lens of the people who raised us. Whether you grew up with an abusive father who really instilled in you the fact that you need to earn his love and there's nothing that you could do to um, actually, oh, sorry. See, more in depth, I would suggest that the disconnect that can come from the list above allowing the sin to run rampant in our, in our hearts um, pushes us to become more aware of our nakedness and the fact that we stand condemned before a holy God. And so with this can come the skewed perspective and instead of seeing God for who he is, it leaves room for us to see God through, through the lens of the people that raised us. So let's say you grew up with an abusive father who constantly had you believing that you had to earn his love, but nothing you did was ever enough. Or you had parents who were verbally, mentally, emotionally, and physically abusive. And so it's hard for you to come to God because you might see him through a similar lens a broken perspective. See, a perspective of God, that sort of perspective of God needs deep healing or we will miss out on the personal and intimate relationship he desires to have with us. And so my suggestion to you, if that is what you're struggling with today, is to pray something that, that I prayed. Um, Father, heal my perspective of you and help me to see you through the lens of Jesus. 
So there's a shame and guilt that can cause us to hide from God because of our nakedness and our awareness that these things are running rampant in our lives and aren't actually pleasing to God. But there's also a hiding amongst, among blessings that I've taken note of that I have taken note of in Genesis 3 verses 9. See, it says that they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. The blessings. They covered themselves up with what God provided for them. How often do we do the same? How often do we think we're in a good place with God because of the many visible blessings in our lives? How often do we think we're doing okay but our relationship with God is actually suffering and lacking intimacy because we're hiding amongst the blessings. I think of the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, where the son chose to take his inheritance from his father and hide amongst his blessings. He squandered the money that his father gave him. See, by the looks of it, because the father was willing to give him this money, um, people might have thought that he had an intimate relationship with his father. But really, that was not the case. Though the father willingly gave him his inheritance, I bet he still repeated to himself daily, where is my son? See, we weren't ever created to be hidden from God. Our sin separates us from God and our shame and guilt can keep us hiding from God with a skewed perspective of him, not being personal. But here's why we don't have to hide from God. And this is my final point, that the veil is torn. Hallelujah. Now this, for the most part, is an Old Testament concept. The veil symbolizes the disconnect between man and God as a result of the fall when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. God's chosen people um, couldn't come to him directly. They didn't have direct access to the Father. And so they had to go through a high priest to intercede for them, to speak with God on their behalf. Now, when I say that the veil is torn, I'm speaking on the fact that God has done something about the distance to, to restore us back to his original intent for us, granting us full access to a personal relationship with him. See, it's greater than, it's greater than God creating new clothes to cover up Adam and Eve. See, in Romans 5, we see that though death and distance came through Adam, life and reconciliation came through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.18 says, Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made right, righteous. See, the veil that was in place between us, see, the veil that was hindering us from coming to the Lord, the veil that was in between us and God because of our sin is now torn. It was torn when Jesus bore our sins on his back and carried them to the cross. And now 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10, 11 says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is the heart of the father who desires a personal relationship with you. To this day, he has not only provide a way for you to be reconciled back to him through the person of Jesus Christ, but we also don't have to hide from him because he stopped at nothing to remove the barrier that stood in between us. 
Continuing with the story of the prodigal son, when the son squandered all of his money and had nothing left, then decided to return back to his father instead of hiding from him, Luke 15 verses 18 to 20 says that he said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still on a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with great compassion for him. And so he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. See, there's something that we can gather, gather from this. Back in the days, if a son demanded his inheritance, it spoke to his desire for his father to die, which was culturally hum humiliating. But here we see the father was still willing to give it to him. Also in verse 19, it says that the prodigal son said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one, or one of your hired servants. This testifies to the son's skewed perspective of his father because his father was still willing to run to him and embrace him as he approached him. Many of us here have this same twisted perspective of who God is. Many of us fail to come to God wholeheartedly because we think his love for us is actually conditional. We think that his love is based on what we do and what we don't do. But until we decide to come to the father, the same way the prodigal son did, we'll actually be feasting on pig food, just like the prodigal son. We'll find ourselves doing the same thing in this world as opposed to feasting with our Heavenly Father. See, God is actually waiting for us and willing to run towards us the moment we decide to draw near to Him through Jesus. I would go as far to say that the Father is waiting for you today. He desires a personal relationship with you. He's aware of the skewed perspectives that can cause an hindrance and, and a disconnect between you and Him. And so today, I believe more than anything, he wants you to know that the veil is actually torn, that you can come to him withholding nothing, that you don't have to hide from him because he desires a personal and fruitful relationship with you. And so would you do that today? Would you come to him wholeheartedly withholding nothing, hiding nothing? And so my question to you is, where are you? because the God of the universe is waiting to embrace you with open arms. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much um, for stopping at nothing to set us free. Thank you for your willingness to reconcile us to yourself. God, you are good, you are good. Jesus, I thank you for your willingness to bear our shame, God, so we no longer have to. Jesus, I thank you that you did not hide yourself from us, but you actually came down to draw close, that you made a way where there seemed to be no way. And so I pray for the person who has a broken perspective of you, Father, that you would heal it. And I pray for the person hiding from you, lacking, lacking intimacy with you, would they taste and see that you are good that your heart towards man is pure and so would be be willing to draw close to you heart abandoned in jesus name amen thank you for joining with us this morning if you need prayer for anything you can text prayer at 905-686-1411 or you can email us our email address is life at christianlifecenter.ca until next time, God bless you.